The bottled message is a trope in storytelling where a character scrawls a message onto paper, places it in a corked bottle, then hurls it into a flowing body of water, either the ocean or a river. Often a desperate attempt at salvation or human connection, the sender of the message through distress or curiosity relies upon a radical arrangement of coincidences to line up before receiving a response. Story makers have used the trope to show how their character has been pushed to their absolute wit's end. Perhaps they found a scrap of paper in a bottle, then prick their fingers so they can scrawl an SOS message in blood, then throw into a body of water. How desperate they must be to hope their savior finds the message, decodes their location, then comes to their rescue. An improbable, if not certainly impossible, jigsaw puzzle-like set of circumstances must neatly fall into place for currents, winds, and waves to push the bottle to any destination, let alone one that will aid its sender. As the ongoing proliferation of digital spaces increasingly changes our relationship to writing by hand, the message in the bottle takes on a new meaning. A message of desperation is sent by a dying person, utilizing a dying means of communication in hopes of connection. Dear Dad, while you were alive, you sent me emails on occasion. I would rarely respond to your questions, often not knowing how to engage, having experienced our relationship to that point. I can't even pinpoint the last serious conversation we ever had, the last time a true connection was made. Was it middle school? Point is, I never knew how to respond to your seemingly banal questions, knowing you were living in a condo my mom paid for so she could keep us from having a homeless father. Knowing just how frail your body and mind became in the last decade of drinking, knowing the state of your apartment after your eviction, how was I supposed to say, yeah, grad school is fine, you still haven't met Cody, but he's fine too, without acknowledging the multitudes of white elephants that stood between you and Connecticut? So I stopped replying. I guess you could say I ghosted you. I found it easier to read and never acknowledge your messages than forcing myself to address the reasons I was uncomfortable. Love, Neil. Bottled messages are also used in romantic stories. Star-crossed lovers connect via an incredibly unlikely set of circumstances, pushing messages of fate, destiny, or even the existence of God into the audience's mind. Most stories that utilize romance as a major plot element require some suspense of disbelief on its audience in order to be cohesive. So it makes perfect sense that the heteronormative god of all things cheesy and vaguely toxic romance novels, Nicholas Sparks, would use a message in the bottle as the main plot element of his novel of the same name. The 1998 book, adapted to a film starring Kevin Costner and Robin Wright in 1999, involves protagonist Teresa, a successful recent divorcee, finding Garrett's message to his lo lost lover, Catherine. What ensues is typical white hetero nonsense, with Teresa somehow magically hunting down Garrett through sourcing his typewriter model or something like that. She then convinces him to take a chance on her, ultimately getting the big kiss that seals the deal. It should be noted that Teresa flew from Boston to North Carolina because a man so incapable of expressing his emotions to the woman he loved, he resorted to typing a letter and throwing it in the damn ocean. The film grossed $18,852,976 in its opening weekend alone, all while set to Natalie Imbruglia's classic bop, Torn. Dear Dad, for years, I have dreaded the idea that your lack of relationship with me is the reason why I consistently find men older than myself to take on lovers. Is it the combination of my messed up form of queerness and a desire to be intimate with a father figure that results in my craving of a daddy to love me? Is there something Freudian going on here? Or am I just interested in chest hair and beards? And how the hell am I supposed to reckon with the fact that as I get closer to 30, there are boys on these apps calling me daddy, craving me inside them, asking me to be rough with them in bed? Where's the line between a daddy and a boy? When does one graduate from young queer trying to find an older man to love to becoming that older man, offering a sense of stability to the boy you used to be? Is my perversion because of you, or did our non-existent relationship simply point me in the direction and I enabled my own slip into degeneracy? 
I cannot deny the pleasure I experience while my body connects with another older male body, and I often don't think too critically about it until well after the fact. Perhaps like the rest of my life and my successes, you are utterly unrelated. I finished college, moved across the country, got married, received my master's degree, and stumbled into a dream career, all without you. Why should my sexual success have anything to do with you? Why bother giving you any form of credit or influence on the pleasure I have found for myself? Love, Neil. Messages and bottles have also been used in a variety of scientific experiments, studying bodies of water in the natural world and their currents. Greek philosopher Theophrastus is said to have carried out water current studies using bottled messages as early as 310 BCE. Benjamin Franklin used bottled messages to discover and approximate the location of the Gulf Stream, which was then confirmed to exist in the mid-1800s. The United States Coast and Geodesic Survey used drift bottles between 1846 and 1964 to analyze ocean currents. These techniques have been phased out by satellite technology and stationary drifters, providing more reliable data on currents, temperature, velocity, etc., without relying on civilians to report found bottles. Drift bottles have been also been used to determine the flow of toxic chemicals after oil spills, garbage and other detritus in the ocean, and even the flow of eggs, larvae, and potentially invasive species. It is uncertain how many of these scientifically aimed bottles, bottled messages, remain in their respective bodies of water, unfound by their intended recipients, and ultimately contributing to the already shame-inducing amount of human-created flotsam in the ocean. Dear Dad, I've been thinking a lot about what went wrong, so to speak. Sometimes I wonder if I could have either prevented or otherwise reversed your spiral into self-destructive addiction had I replied to your emails. Could a connection between us have resulted in a reason for you to get help? Would you have put down the bottle if I took the time to answer? Exploring my feelings while I ask these questions seems answer enough. In spite of asking myself if I could have prevented your extreme alcoholism, I never once felt responsible for your decline in health and your death. I never blamed myself for what happened, even when questioning my power and ability to help. I subconsciously or otherwise recognize it was never my responsibility to save you. Rereading your emails in that light offers a new question. Were you attempting to manipulate me? I had heard you ask Kyle and Scott for money numerous times. Did I not receive those questions because I never let you get that far in the dialogue? Were your attempts at connection a means to an end, or did you genuinely want to resolve our estrangement? Even if I could get an answer, I'm not sure I'd read it. Love, Neil. Bottled messages have also played a small role in an otherwise largely underdiscussed history of psychological warfare, utilizing a variety of techniques to psychologically terrorize civilians and soldiers from enemy populations. Bottled messages have been used in a variety of conflicts to deliver propaganda to civilians. Soldiers specializing in psyops prepared specific messages to create doubt in the mind of civilians, offer them an opportunity to, to defect or otherwise create confusion. In addition to aiding violent regimes, including the United States, bottled messages are also used by individuals to indoctrinate whoever finds the message to accept their religious teachings as truth. These bottle preachers send their written sermons out into oceans or streams with the hopes that some lonely denizen will find it, read it, and accept the presented route to salvation. Much like the more romantic forms of the bottled message, this usage requires a set of circumstances similar to a Rube Goldberg machine to fall into place before the recipient stumbles upon it. Unlike our deserted traveler, however, bottled preachers have both faith and knowledge that God's plan will lead their bottle through the ocean to a sad, lost soul. Dear Dad, every once in a while, 
for whatever reason, I remembered when I was a kid and you would still visit us at mom's house on occasion. I remember you would wear a WWJD bracelet. I remember that imagery feeling just as jarring at the time as we're calling it now feels, knowing how completely and utterly immersed we were in the church and your complete absence. While at the time I questioned your authentic Christian beliefs, I now wonder if you were trying to signal to us an attempt at change, whether real or fabricated. We were still very much children, so certainly more malleable than our adult versions. Before the divorce, living in Illinois, I only remember attending church towards the end of your marriage. It was a rare thing, while in Nebraska it became twice-weekly ritual, Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights. Mom has said to me her faith helped her through a lot, and I'm sure this change in routine was emblematic of that. But regardless of location, we never saw you at church. Despite attending a private Christian college with mom, the church wasn't an aspect of your life until the divorce. So this bracelet has shifted in my perspective as a virtue signal. You never cared about it, just wanted us to think you did so we would trust you more. It didn't work, clearly. The irony of the whole situation is that if you did find religion, like so many people who go through 12-step programs, maybe you'd still be here, and maybe these letters would have remained unwritten. Love, Neil. Bottles are, of course, most often associated with beverages and liquids. Glass as a material is a strong, reliable, and easily recyclable substance, so long as it is treated correctly and properly disposed of. Bo blown glass bottles have been around since as early as 1 BCE, replacing a more fragile form of bottle making involving dipping clay forms directly into molten glass. Bottles have been used for a range of liquid materials, including beverages, but also cosmetics, pharmaceuticals, preservatives, pickled food, and condiments. When a glass bottle is dropped and shatters, the liquid inside plays a role in its breaking. Called the water hammer effect, or hydraulic shock, the liquid inside the bottle is subjected to a sudden change in momentum. The ensuing pressure wave can cause stress in the glass container, aiding in its already compromised position and ultimately causing the bottle to shatter. While glass is already prone to shatter when dropped, there is a certain pleasant irony in knowing that its contents have the ability to destroy its own container. In those regards, it's also revealing to recognize humans' work in a similar manner. Dear Dad, the one positive influence you've had on my life is the resistance and refusal to ever drink anything alcoholic. To this day, at the age of 29, I've never imbibed in anything alcoholic. I haven't smoked nicotine or marijuana, and I can honestly say I never plan on starting. Even while touring in punk bands across the country, getting offered shots, drink tickets, and other opportunities to get wasted, I never did. I wonder if this is some form of stubborn, I'll never become my father kind of rebellion. But of course, this deeply authentic part of my personality has led to a handful of debilitating habits and ritualistic choices. My, my disdain for all things alcoholic and alcohol culture has actually hindered my connection to the queer community, whose events and gatherings often occur either at bars or alcohol-infused events. My vices instead are sugary drinks, greasy foods, and self-deprecation. So thanks for that, I guess. Love, Neil. Glass bottling of beer dates as far back as the 16th century, yet it wouldn't be until the 18th century that the technology was perfected. The long neck design was ultimately the solution to the problem of glass bottles not being strong enough to withstand the pressure from CO2 gases used in the beer making process. For alcoholic beverages, specifically beer and other fermented drinks, darkened glass is, often, is most often used for the bottles. The main reason is to aid in blocking UV light from penetrating the glass and altering the taste of the liquid inside. 
Clear glass leads to a quicker spoiling or skunking of the beer. Glass was used in the first place because it was identified as the best material to preserve freshness. Yet this conundrum created a dilemma as the demand for beer skyrocketed after the First World War. Scientists and brewers eventually discovered the sun and its light was the culprit. So a darker glass was needed. Brown glass was first used, followed by green. Today, it's easy to see that various brands will choose between the two colors based on their branding identity, with brown being, anecdotally speaking at least, the most used color. <clears throat> Dear Dad, the last time I saw you was at Kyle's wedding. You had pressured Mom into telling us all about Trish, the supposed fiancé you had hidden from us for four years, so we wouldn't be surprised by her presence. In typical Harry Orion's fashion, you found yourself incapable of explicitly telling us something important, and instead relied on Mon, preferring shallow conversation between yourself and your sons. You were sat at a table, the two of you, far away from the rest of the family, and all by yourselves. To be fair, the other guests who were supposed to be seated around you did not show up, but the metaphor was apparent and fitting. It was also fitting just how close to the bar you were located. Cody and I went up to get a couple Cokes, where you, for lack of better words, ambushed us to say hello. It was your first time meeting him, and while I had tried to preface the trip to South Dakota with as much background information I could think would be relevant, it wasn't enough to prepare him for your decrepit body and face. Sunken eyes, a suit that probably fit you at some point, and a cloud of cigarette smoke that followed you wherever you went. A sudden sense of context filled Cody's mind, understanding my reluctance to talk about you, my failure at finding the right vocabulary to discuss my feelings about you and your role in our family. I met Trish that night, our short conversation starting with her calling me Cody when we got coffee, which felt weirdly fitting given the surreality of the whole thing. You were found dead in your car by the Omaha Police Department. Trish had disappeared before then, I assume due to some kind of falling out between you two. The cause of death was most likely a stroke or heart failure of some kind. Scott and Kyle took care of all the arrangements, going through your condo and searching the, for the things we'd want to keep and throw away the rest. There was never an expectation for me to travel back to Nebraska to help. I felt relief in my distance, and I assumed my brothers, though graciously doing what they did, felt a pang of jealousy, wishing they were in the same position. Had I been closer, of course I would have helped, and had Scott or Kyle been far away, I wouldn't have expected them to come. We didn't have a ceremony. We just cremated you as soon as we could. You currently rest in a plastic bag contained in a box, somewhere probably in my mom's house. I don't know what the future your ashes hold. P perhaps we'll put them in a bottle and send them in the ocean. <clears throat>